Insperity presents the Small Business Advocate Show with Jim Blassingame, brought to you by FedEx, CareerBuilder.com, and Palo Alto Software. This is a copyrighted production of Small Business Network, Inc., all rights reserved. Hello, so Barbara Lewis bringing us back. Classic song, 17 Till. Welcome back. I'm Jim Blassingame. My website is smallbusinessadvocate.com. Thank you for using it. I appreciate it very much. You got we got lots of stuff there. You can subscribe to my newsletter. You can uh, listen. You can read. You can ask questions. And don't forget to take our poll question right there on the homepage. Different question. Every week we want to know what you think. And we're having a great visit with our good friend Ted Fishman. Ted is the author of Shock of Grey. Ted, recently um, we, we asked our, our newsletter audience and our, and our website audience, and, and I mentioned it on the, on the radio, whether they thought that, that, that you know, I, I posed the point that, that uh, some hard decisions are going to have to be made by, by the federal government primarily, but also the state governments. On, on 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 future benefits, on on reining in the this 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 overspending, on reining in the deficits, and dealing with the hard financial decisions, and so we asked them this question. We said, we said, uh, um, uh, if if you want, would you be willing to include changes in the programs that you're going to receive in the future? to reduce the long-term deficit. In other words, would you be willing to accept the fact that there's going to have to be some changes made? And uh, the good news was 83% of our audience said that they would be willing to accept some changes. Well, I think your audience is a little savvier than um, the, the mass of employees who, who, who get checks, you know, because they're self-starters. And probably they most of my folks are not. Most of my folks are probably not state employee union members. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. And they understand, you know, the the demands of a business. That well, they, they probably make a lot of them probably make payroll on Friday. That that'll change your attitude a lot too. That's right. That's right. And and they want the same. They want the same discipline in their in their government. Right. And um, and they're probably uh, more prudent in in, in their long term saving strategies too. Um, uh, do you, do we, you you know, Ted? The, the the main thing I wanted to get across in, in our visit is that. Is that public employee unions? I think are not a good thing. I, I'm a, I, I don't agree with them. I don't like them. I think I think they should. I personally think they should be abolished. I think they don't serve a, a, a productive purpose anymore. They may have at one time, but they don't anymore. But we got them, and this, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to get get rid of them. But but they clearly seem to not be part of the solution these days. What do you think? You know, it's a mixed bag for me. You know, there's there's. I was looking at the numbers on Wisconsin, and um, one of the things about teachers' unions, for example, is that they do, te- you know, we live in a country now that really demands better teachers. Uh, and there's uh, five states in the country that do not have teachers' unions. None of them ranks uh, above 44 mm-hmm. in the qualifications of the teachers it attracts in terms of their SAT scores. Um, it's quite stunning. Mm-hmm. So um, those those four states are South Carolina, it ranks last. North Carolina, it ranks second to last. Georgia, it ranks third to last. Mm-hmm. Texas, it ranks fourth to last. Mm-hmm. And Virginia, which ranks uh, sixth to last. Um, and if, if, if you don't have a mechanism that can compensate teachers and get teachers the compensation they need, you don't get the teachers that you need. Um you know, the thing about a public sector, it has to be, in some ways, it has to be the most efficient sector with the best workers. And, um, you know, if you're driving down the salaries of, of those workers, um, it's, it's also going to be hard to get the efficiencies we need uh, as, as we strive towards good, efficient government. Um, but, but the, so uh, I don't know whether unions are the answer, but you need some mechanism. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, definitely think, I definitely think the teachers should be paid more than they probably are, but I also think there should be uh, some some performance requirements too. And the problem I got with unions is it doesn't always provide the performance. But let's let's go back to the bigger picture. The bigger picture is we have an aging population globally, not just the United States, but globally. There's a there's a a significant situation going on right now with funding the 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 care and the, and the retirement 
and and the the older years of of our aging population. What are we going to do about it, Ted? You know, this is a huge issue. This is exactly this kind of triage that's happening at the state level right now. You know that they're pushing away. They're trying to push away with the rollback of the unions the age-related expenses. The question is, can you work with within the system that exists or revise it so that the age-related expenses become less burdensome? Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm a big advocate for uh, uh, pushing people to make more of that last third of life, uh, finding ways to keep them in the workforce, uh, demanding that those who are capable uh, have high expectations for themselves in the workforce and be part of the project of our country. I, I don't plan to retire, Ted. But see, what we've got <laughs> what we've got here is we still have vestiges of 20th century mentality in 21st century re- reality. That's the well, problem. You know, people tend to retire around 62, which is when you can right now start taking your social security. But that's a 20th century construct. And they will live if they make it to 62. If, if you and I are in a relationship, you know, with our spouse and we mm-hmm. both make it to 62, there's a 50-50 chance that one of us is going to make it to 95. Yeah. I don't think that we can as a country make it unless we are making you know, that last third of life more productive. Right, exactly. And and not, not dependent upon every nickel we get coming from from, from somebody else. And that, that but again, of course the good news is is I like working. And yeah. I, I plan on working. I like being productive. I'm my biggest worry for myself is not that I not that I when not when can I retire, but what how can I stay productive? What what will I be doing twenty years from now? That's what I'm more worried about than anything. Well, you know, people do start to uh, diverge from one another once you reach age 60. There are yeah. about a third of the people at 65 who really can't work anything right. like they used to, but two-thirds can. Yeah, when they should, I think. Hold on to that thought. Uh, Ted, give us your website quickly, please. TedCFishman.com Quick quick break. Ten tail. Stay with us. Insperity presents the Small Business Advocate Show with Jim Blassingame, brought to you by FedEx, CareerBuilder.com, and Palo Alto Software. This is a copyrighted production of Small Business Network, Inc., intended for the private use of our audience. Except as otherwise provided by copyright law, all other copying, redistribution, or publication without prior written consent is prohibited. All rights reserved. Prohibited. All rights reserved. Prohibited. 